Hello, and welcome to another Science Saturday. Before we delve into today's topic, I wanted to let you know that I'm posting to the Scientific Directors page on our website, blogs that complement the talks I've been giving. The blogs will cover the same material I cover in these talks, but give a bit more detail and information. The blog on natural history studies has been posted, and the blog on gene therapy should be up soon. I encourage you to go check them out if you're interested. Today, the topic I want to discuss with you concern preclinical studies. If I were to show you a vial of liquid and said it was a cure for STXBP1, and I wanted to inject your child with it, what would be your reaction? At first, you might be excited, but fairly soon, you would probably be asking a lot of questions like, what's exactly in the vial? How does it work? What evidence do you have that it works? Where did you get it? And importantly, is it safe? All of these are excellent questions, and they're what preclinical studies are designed to answer. In very broad terms, a preclinical study is any study that's not performed in people. In more specific terms, preclinical studies refer to a phase in the drug development process. Now, the drug development process is long, and it's regulated. What I mean by regulated is that there are agencies like the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, or the European Medicines Agency, EMA, that require specific types of data that need to be collected about a drug before it can be tested in people. Generally, drug development includes a drug discovery phase during which drug candidates are identified in a preclinical phase where drug candidates are tested to determine if they work and if they're safe. The drug discovery phase usually begins in the laboratory of either a university researcher or a pharmaceutical company. For example, a scientist might have a new insight into a disease process that leads to a new class of drugs that could be used to treat a disease. Or they may have developed a new technology such, such as gene editing that might be useful in treating a disease. From this starting point, potential drug candidates are developed. Drug dis discovery can take years of research and include a multitude of studies. For example, development of animal and cell models of the disease or methods that allow you to detect the drug in blood or assess its activity. For example, I spent several years at the University of Pittsburgh doing drug discovery research. Our team of scientists would identify a neurological condition that we thought we might be able to treat like chronic pain. We would design and construct different gene therapy drugs that we thought might be useful. We tested these gene therapy drugs, first in cells and then in animal models, to make sure the drugs had the intended biological effect we were aiming for, and to identify which drugs appeared to be most effective in reducing pain. All of this work was intended to provide what's called proof of concept. That is proof that the drug candidate had the potential to treat the disease or the condition. Once a drug candidate is identified, it enters the preclinical phase of drug development. And this usually involves a set of studies designed to address concerns from regulatory agencies like the FDA or EMA. There are many different preclinical studies that can be and are required by regulatory agencies to be performed, but they tend to address two basic concerns, drug dosing and drug safety. It may seem to be a very obvious point, but it's important to identify a biologically active dose of a drug. This is the dose of the drug that'll have an effect on the disease that you're trying to treat. It's also important to identify the best way to administer the drug. For example, will it be taken by mouth? Will it be injected into the blood or into body tissues, applied to the skin or inhaled? While it may seem simple, this can be difficult to determine. For example, you need to know how long a drug takes before it becomes effective. You need to know how long the drug remains in the body once it's taken. This can tell you how often you need to take the drug in order to maintain the effective dose of the drug in the body. For example, do you need to take the drug once a day, once a week, once a month, or maybe just once ever? You probably also need to know where the drug goes in the body once you take it, because this might tell you about potential side effects. 
And all of this has to be done in animal models. And you use the results to make a best guess as to what doses you can start testing in people. However, the major concern of preclinical studies is safety. And there are many studies performed to determine the safety of drug candidates. For example, does a drug cause cancer? Does it cause DNA mutation? Does it cause damage to heart, brain, lungs, kidneys, or other major organs? And if so, at what doses? Some studies examine the potential long-term toxic effects of drugs, or if the drug has an adverse effect on the reproduction system or the development of embryos or fetus. Other studies focus on negative environmental impacts of a drug or negative impacts that the drug might have on other drugs that people are taking. These are known as drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Still other studies look at for potential toxic compounds that might have been introduced into the drug during its manufacturing process. All of these safety studies are types of studies that regulatory agencies might require before they allow a drug candidate to be tested in the person. Though the exact type of safety studies required depend upon the type of drug being tested. For example, gene therapy drugs have different requirements for safety compared to classic pharmaceutical drugs. The point of all of these preclinical studies is to reduce uncertainty. There are inherent risks associated with any drug. And what preclinical studies do is reduce the uncertainty of what those inherent risks might be before they're tested in people. In order to accomplish this, it's important that preclinical studies be performed on animal and cellular models that represent the intended patient population. And what's tested is representative of the final drug that would be used in people. For example, for an STX BP1 drug, some preclinical studies might be run in zebrafish or mouse models of SDXBP1 in order to help define what doses improve behavioral outcomes. But certain safety studies might be better conducted in animals more representative of humans in size and physiology, such as pigs or non-human primates. Ultimately, all of the preclinical studies that are performed increase our confidence that a new drug candidate will likely be safe and hopefully effective when it's finally tested in people. Well, I hope this talk helped shed some light on drug development process and how important preclinical studies are in that process. We'll continue our discussion on the drug development process next week when I discuss clinical trials. As always, feel free to ask me any questions and let me know if you're enjoying these talks. Thank you.